Hello everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, today we have Mark Shepard here from New York. Uh, luckily we were able to intercept him while he's here f uh, for the International Architecture Biennale in Rotterdam. Um, tomorrow he is giving a keynote lecture on the subject of connectivity and uh, on Friday he's conducting a workshop in Rotterdam. Uh, Mark is an artist, media architect, researcher, educator, and curator, uh, focusing on information technology and network infrastructure. Um, through his curious hybrid objects and services, Mark is able to bring awareness of invisible structures uh, all around us and cast them into a more active role in our social existence. This Saturday marks the closing of Toward the Sentient City, Mark's successful curatorial venture, uh, which is based on installations of embedded intelligence around New York City. And I would like to thank Mark for being so flexible in changing his plans to come to Eindhoven uh, at the last minute, and also to Franz uh, for his quick coordination. And on that note, here's Mark Shepard. Um, hi, thank you for coming. Um, and thank you, Patricia, for that lovely introduction. And, um, and of course, to Franz very, very much for the invitation to come here. Um, you know, it's a little bit serendipitous in the sense that, uh, yes, I was sort of rerouted, so to speak, um, you know, from, from uh, between New York and Rotterdam, but it's, it's uh, very happy to be here um, and to have a chance to give a talk which um, kind of covers a range of issues, but is organized around one current project that I'm, I'm, I'm developing. Um, um, partly it has, I'm not going to talk about the exhibition tonight. I'm going to talk about a related project to that exhibition that I'm um, that I'm working on, and I'm going to try to go a little bit deeper into that than I might normally for a more general audience, given the fact that uh, we are, um, to a certain extent, um, related in terms of at least a focus on design sociality in its broadest sense, right, and how we begin to engage that as as artists, designers, <coughs> architects, and so forth. Um, I teach, uh, just a, by way of introduction, I teach at the University of Buffalo, and I have a joint appointment there between uh, the Department of Architecture and the Department of Media Study. And what that enables me is a tremendous amount of uh, freedom in terms of the territory that I'm able to explore in my research. I direct uh, the Center for Architecture and Situated Technologies, together with Omar Khan, and my colleague in the Department of Architecture. And I also coordinate a, a dual degree program between the Media Study Department and the Architecture Department uh, called the Media Architecture Computing Program. And it's where we work with graduate students very intensely on some of these issues, um, both in terms of the kind of intellectual and conceptual frameworks within which uh, the technical skills as well are developed. Um, just a quick check though before we get going. Can, you, can everyone, everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Yeah. Should I speak up or should I speak slowly or speak faster? It's perfect. It's good. Okay. Well, we'll see. Okay. Um, I'm not going to talk very much about these just previous projects, uh, the Tactical Sound Garden. Um, this is an open source software platform for shaping the sonic topography of cities uh, using a kind of Wi-Fi enabled mobile devices. Um, uh, using using a mobile phone or a laptop or a PDA. Uh, participants are able to plant sounds within a positional audio environment, so sort of a 3D audio environment, which then gets mapped onto the coordinates of a physical geographic space. Um, so effectively over overlaying a publicly constructed soundscape onto a specific urban space. Um, the project draws on the culture of community gardening. Uh, in this case, this sort of natural metaphor is very much important. Gardens being something which are um, uh, appealing to the sensorium in a kind of broad sense, both smell, touch, and so forth. Uh, but it's also a participatory environment, w uh, which aims to explore new spatial practices and social interactions that, that are enabled by uh, these types of technologically mediated environments. 
Um, so wearing headphones connected to one of these Wi-Fi enabled devices, uh, participants in the project are drift through virtual sound gardens as they move throughout the city. Um, this is now actually uh, a fairly old map of Wi-Fi hotspots in New York City. And the project relies on these as beacons for wayfinding, for locate, determining the location of the device, right? So effectively, uh, it's using the kind of market proliferation of everyone buying a Wi-Fi access point, right? A hub, a Linksys hub or a Wi-Fi hub. Mm -hmm. And uses them to effectively serve as beacons in the landscape, enabling one to determine the location of a device in the physical space. Um, so in this sense, it's a kind of parasitic, par parasitic technology, right? It's one which isn't specific, and I don't have control over this at a certain level. And working within wireless networks, working within uh, particularly the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, pub so-called public spectrum, right? Um, the unlicensed spectrum um, is, is highly un un unpredictable. And in, in, in my work, this becomes um, increasingly important thematic. Um, mm. So the project's iterated uh, in multiple cities over time. Um, generally speaking, I'm working with different uh, community organizations in developing the installation in each place. Um, and each iteration enables me to look at different parameters of uh, the sound garden, how to tweak one, uh, say, who, who has access to, to the garden, who, who determines um, who has access to the garden, who can contribute, um, let's say, an initial library of sounds. Um, is it completely open? Is it uh, sort of a smaller subset of uh, people, say, a uh, group of local sound artists who create sounds to be planted by others? These parameters, because it's an iterative project, can be explored um, over time and um, evaluated in different cases. Okay, I'm going to try to speed up a little bit. This is a more recent project also dealing with uh, wireless networks. Um, it's called Hertzian Rain, and it's more of a variable event structure. Um, and it's really designed to kind of raise awareness after working with the sort of wireless spectrum of the sound garden. It's really designed to raise issues surrounding um, the wireless topography of urban space, particularly in relationship to this um, notion of a competition for signal dominance. Uh, one thing that happens when you have congested um, uh, network spaces is that you'll have signals competing for each other. The uh, common uh, occurrence of this is um, uh, radio frequencies, which, <clears throat> as you know, probably, when you're driving or uh, moving through, you, you sometimes you'll have one station competing with the other, right, to, to try to gain sort of the upper hand, so, so to speak, and, and, and your attention, obviously, um, by you being able to hear it. So this project was really developed to try to uh, make that quality of phenomenon more palpable. Um, so it addresses this competition for signal dominance through a participatory scenario for real-time asymmetrical communication between sound makers, uh, which may be sound artists, DJs, or spoken word performers, and sound listeners, uh, an audience, or hybrids thereof. So the, mm, the structure is really to set up structures to set up um, these wireless audio transmitters and have them broadcasting on the same frequency and to create a zone of overlap or interference between them. Within that, then, <clears throat> to situate a series of umbrellas made out of an RF uh, electromagnetic field shielding fabric, right? So these umbrellas act as shields, right? Dampening this, the signal level of each of the radio transmitters, depending upon how it's oriented. On the top, then, is an accelerometer, which takes the movement of the umbrellas and, through a wireless mesh networking radio modem, broadcasts the movement data back to the people making the sound. So you have this kind of asymmetrical communication between the sound makers, on the one hand, right, and their kind of competition for signal dominance. The movement of people with the umbrellas, which to a certain degree is shaping that sonic space, the Hertzian space around uh, the umbrellas. And then that, move, that, that data of movement being collectively uh, sent back, aggregated, and into this kind of feedback loop. <clears throat> uh, this was uh, 
prototyped and workshopped at uh, iBeam. They do this uh, event uh, quarterly called Mixer, and it's really a fantastic uh, opportunity to get people who really want to try something out. Um, so you, anytime you're working with interactive um, uh, structures, participatory structures, um, it's absolutely essential that you workshop it, that, that you deploy it, that you study how people interact and behave, um, you know, with or misbehave, even better some kind, sometimes, with, with uh, the structure that you set up. <clears throat> and so this, this, this was a very, uh, very, very fruitful um, <clears throat> event in that regard. You know, you find out what works, you find out what doesn't work. Um, certain things, for example, uh, with umbrellas. Um, people generally have an idea about what to do with an umbrella. It's a prop from everyday life that we, we understand. We, we, it has certain design affordances which we can identify with and relate to. Um, uh, this one movement, particularly the, para I call it the parasol movement, where people take the umbrella and twirl it. Right? You know, they have it over the shoulder and twirl it. Well, with an accelerator on, accelerometer on the top of the umbrella, you have this incredible you know, s uh, spinning, spinning data being generated by that movement. So it's something you can actually sense and pick out. And you can you know, begin to understand certain types of movements and behaviors. Um, and how then the people making the sound react to that becomes, becomes really interesting. So you know, here, just really a you know, very simple set of parameters enabling one to look at different uh, patterns of um, interaction and sociality um, on a very, very mm, abstract level. <clears throat> OK. We we'll spend a little bit more time talking about uh, this project. This uh, current project um, titled the Sentient City Survival Kit. Um, and the project uh, is really a design research project which uh, explores uh, the social, cultural, political implications of ubiquitous computing for urban environments. And it consists of, does the project consists of designing, fabricating, and then presenting a collection of artifacts, spaces, and media for survival in the near future sentient city. <clears throat> so as computing leaves the desktop and it spills out onto the sidewalk streets and public spaces of everyday life, uh, ubiquitous um, um, information processing becomes embedded in and distributed throughout the material fabric of everyday space. Um, ubiquitous computing evangelist herald a coming age, uh, and you've, you're probably familiar with some of this rhetoric, right? Uh, you know, this, um, <clears throat> urban information systems capable of sensing and responding to the events and activities transpiring around them, um, imbued with the capacity to remember, to correlate, and to anticipate this sentient city is envisioned by some, at least, of being capable of reflexively monitoring our behavior within it and becoming an active agent in the organization of our daily lives. Now, few people will probably have a problem with smart traffic control systems which more efficiently manage the ebb and flow of buses and cars and trucks on city streets, right? Uh, generally speaking, um, we can reduce traffic, uh, and particularly reduce people driving. Uh, this is a great place for uh, things like bicycles, for example, alternates to driving. But you know, we're pro we probably have less of an issue with um, embedded computational processing, uh, managing ebbs and flows of tr uh, cars. Some of us will probably be irritated when we pass by some um, you know, international global coffee chain, um, whose name I won't go and reiterate. Um, but as we pass by, we get a discount coupon for our favorite espresso drink, which we've purchased there every, every day for the last month, beamed to our mobile phone, right? Some of us are going to find that int uh, irritating, right? <clears throat> Many, however, are likely to protest when uh, we're denied passage through a subway turnstile or entrance into a transportation hub because the system senses that our mobility patterns, our purchasing history, and our current galvanic skin response happens to match the profile of a terrorist, right? So these kind of false positive matches when data mining coming from different sources get brought together. Um, <clears throat> these technologies are, are, when I say near future, are, you know, I'm talking within five years. I'm not talking about you know, science fiction here. These, these are technological systems platforms which are, in some cases, in place. Well, I'll show a few in a minute. 
Um, but um, also just, just upstream in the current research and development world and as the uh, computer science uh, communities. <clears throat> okay, so you know the, the project then intends to sort of critically explore the darker side of this near future sentient city. It's conceived of as a kind of archaeology of the near future, uh, which posits a set of playful and uh, ironic techno-social artifacts that raise awareness about issues related to conditions of privacy, trust, serendipity, and autonomy in this highly efficient and ever overcoated city. Um, <clears throat> Now, in Patricia's introduction, she also mentioned um, the exhibition Toward the Sentient City. This is a show I curated uh, with uh, the Architectural League of New York. We brought together five interdisciplinary teams to produce uh, installations and projects distributed literally throughout the city. And the survival kit itself is inspired in some ways by this photo collage or it's not actually this photo composition produced by a British architect by the name of Warren Chalk was part of the group Archigram. Um, they organized an exhibition in 1963 at the ICA in London called Living City. And so there's a kind of expressed relationship I wanted to create between uh, the exhibition happening in 1963 and uh, what we were doing in 2009. And so the survival kit then becomes a way to do a kind of sub-project or side project, uh, which in some way, uh, you know, Warren, Warren Chalk's project was very much about the kind of um, flotsam and jetsam of everyday urban life in, in London. This is 1963, right? This is the so-called swinging London, right? You know, sort of jazz, uh, <clears throat> um, sex, uh, guns, drugs, right? Play, Playboy, John Coltrane, Ornette Coleman, uh, pop product products, puffed wheat, Wonder Bread, right? These these kind of um, <clears throat> common everyday artifacts. Uh, Archigram argued that they, they they were as important, if not more important, than the built fabric, right? The designed uh, built fabric of architecture in organizing how one experienced the city and the vitality of the city. So it's a little bit the territory um, I wanted to work with here. Now, what is um, what is a sentient city? Now, um, if we look at the uh, Latin roots, sentience refers, generally speaking, to the ability to feel, versus, say, a sapere, right, which generally refers to things which we know. So. <clears throat> When we're talking about a sentient city, the sentient city is something which, you know, feels you but doesn't necessarily know you, right? Mm. Um, so it should be clear that from the outset we, we have to distinguish between two things. First, uh, sensing is something that animals, plants, and um, some machines can do, right? It normally involves a sensing organ or device uh, which enables a system of which it is part to actively respond to environmental circumstances. Um, a system may sense light, sound, temperature, presence of water. Um, second, though, sentience, as opposed to sensing, right, um, having a sensation or a feeling about something, um, is not specifically tied to sensing, right? Which is to say, sensations or sentience is more than just sensing something, right? Um, mm, for it involves an internal state in which what is sensed or what's brought in is somehow processed. And it's processed in such a way to carry and you know, develop a subjective character, right? It's something which takes on a quality which is more than just there's, you know, this much light or there's, uh, it's the, the temperature is this warm or there are this many people moving through this space at a certain time. Those are things, all things you can sense, right? But when we're talking about sentience, we're talking about the kind of inferences that start to get made about, you know, what it means that this many people are moving through this space at this time. What happens when we correlate things like, um, you know, where the different places you visited over the last week, which we know because you've used a, um, you know, a, um, an RFID uh, embedded in, uh, you know, a, uh, a like your metro card, for example, in New York City, which is actually not even RFID at this point, it's just magnetic stripe, right? So 
ultimately, when we're talking about sentience, we're talking about something which is beginning to correlate, beginning to bring together disparate bits of information which are sensed or collected or gathered. And you know, the, through, through our daily lives, it's, it's, it's remarkable how many different systems we interact with on a daily basis which are collecting information about us. Um, Artificial systems can also sense, uh, sorry, can also uh, sense without being um, uh, sentient. That is, they can make sensory discriminations but not have a sensation stick. This is red, this is blue, right? At the same time, people can be sentient without having, you know, without sensing anything, right? I mean, if you think about dreams, for example, right? We have sensations, right? Without necessarily seeing something or hearing something. Uh, hallucinations. Um, so, what I'd like to do then just quickly is to, to, to look a little bit at this meme of the sentient city along three vectors here. And then I'm going to go and talk at the end just about these four, these four parts of this sentient city survival kit that I'm developing. First is the sentient city as a kind of technological fantasy. Uh, when I first started the project, of course, you know, I googled uh, sentient city to you know, see what was out there, right? And just a, and Google is a good way to get a very quick cross section. It's not obviously it's not um, uh, at all by any means comprehensive in that regard. But what this um, uh, first thing that showed up was Ranks, the Sentient City, DC Comics, 1981. Uh, Ranks is one of the more unusual life forms in the universe. Um, its origins are unknown, uh, according to folklore. Ranks is as old as the stars. Uh, circuitry running across and through each quadrant of the city enables Ranks to observe and act upon anything in its vicinity. Uh, Ranks can control gravitational forces in virtually any area and can control the very ground itself. Uh, data feeds connect to a command center with a central processing unit, perhaps a quasi-organic brain, right? 1981. Uh, Solaris, the sentient planet, right? Um, how many people are familiar with Stanislaw Ledin's novel? Right, one for the no the book. Okay, what about the films? Tarkovsky's film. Few people, right? Okay. Uh, Steven Soderbergh's film, George Clooney. All right. Well, okay. So like, let me just briefly summarize. I mean, you know, Solaris is a, a sentient planet, right? It's a planet made up of this um, stuff, this substance, which uh, exhibits an alien uh, quality of, of, of uh, sentience, which is important, right? Stanislaw Lem, as uh, a science fiction writer, for him, it was very important that um, you know, sentience, non-human sentience, was other, right? We didn't try to make it something which was uh, like us. In other words, uh, uh, sort of non-human sentience was not anthropomorphized, right? Um, it was other, and it was important that it remained other, that it was something which we couldn't identify, couldn't relate to, it was not human. Um, Hal, on the other hand, um, the invention of Arthur C. Clarke and later Stanley, Stanley Kubrick in the Space Odyssey, um, is an art artificial intelligence which is highly anthropomorphized, right? Um, Hal is capable of not only speech recognition, facial recognition, natural language processing, uh, but also lip reading, art appreciation, interpreting emotions, expressing, expression, expressing emotions, reasoning, and of course, chess. Excuse me. All of this in addition to maintaining all systems on an interplanetary voyage. Um, <clears throat> I think you know this this um, uh, exchange, classic exchange between Dave Bowman and Hal, right? You know, begins to describe how very different this approach about thinking about sentience in non-human uh, life forms, such as uh, machines or cities, right, uh, comes out, right? So you know, on the one hand, there's a notion that we anthropomorphize non-human sentience, right? Things which aren't like us but have the capability to develop sensations, not just sense, but develop some sense of subjective qualities of sensation, um, versus ones which actually their sentience is anthropos. We make them human. We project human qualities onto. 
So this, you know, this is this is, and this is an age-old argument, right? And it gets back down. To, I mean, you can trace it back to people like Leibniz in his monadology, or Descartes in his Meditations on First Philosophy, right? This classic mind-body problem, right? You know, where where is a thought, right? Where is a feeling? Where does this exist? And um, I'm not going to go into. The, I mean, there's a whole philosophical philosophical discussion we can get into at the moment, which you know, goes through people like um, Gilbert Rye, uh, for example, and where you know, this, this sort of mind-body dualism, a kind of classic Cartesian dualism, breaks down the minute you start to not see the two as necessarily in opposition, right? Which is to say that, you know, the, the ability to think, you know, where a thought is, right? And where the kind of material or the organic matter which produces the chemical reactions in the brain which produces that thought. Uh, exist don't necessarily need to be understood as um, um, uh, in a kind of as a dichotomy, right? Anyway, we're not going to have that discussion right now, at least. Um, I don't, we don't have time. But the sentient city as, sec as a technical challenge is also this is the next the next vector I want to look at and. You know, this is this is the world of computer science and engineering. This is the the world of um, um, the big technology players, right? Uh, you know, when a an uh, journal or a, a magazine like The Economist uh, devotes uh, a special report um, on the coming age of ubiquitous computing, that we're we're moving beyond just the idea of this idea existing in. Uh, kind of isolated research, research lab somewhere, right? Um, but it's beginning to enter into the kind of broader public consciousness. And so we have things like, you know, the ability to, you know, we don't lose, I mean, you know, this, this cover I think plays out, you know, some really kind of by now almost cliched examples, right? You know, in the near future, no longer are we going to lose our car keys or our apartment keys, right? We'll just Google them and we'll find them, right? Um, our dog will tweet us when it wants to go for a walk or needs to go outside. <clears throat> um, our tap water will self-report its pH balance, right, and level of dissolved oxygen. Um, the classic uh, cliche in, in this sort of world is the refrigerator, which is able to sense that you're low on mil milk and is able to connect to the supermarket and place an order for you. Um, and so on, and so on. I mean, we're probably, we're all familiar with the different types of projections that have been made. But um, this is actually uh, not the world of science fiction. We're talking about uh, the world of computer science and engineering, which is uh, 1991. A um, person by the name of Mark Fizer publishes in Scientific American uh, this article, Computer for the 21st Century, saying the most powerful technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they are indistinguishable from it. Um, the idea that somehow, you know, when computing leaves the desktop, it spills off into the world around us, and it's embedded in things. It's carried around with me, and with say a mobile phone. Um, it's uh, um, networked together through wired and wireless networks. Um, the intention here, the vision that Weiser had was that it would bring us back to sort of, rather than sitting prone in front of a screen and a keyboard and a mouse, it brings us back to the sort of social interaction. This is the vision, this is the projection, right? That computing would disappear, recede to the background, and it would foreground human interaction again, augmented through computational processes. Uh, <clears throat> He ends this article talking about a walk in the woods, and he says, there's, there's more information available at our fingertips during a walk in the woods than in any computer system. Yet people find a walk among trees relaxing and computers frustrating. Machines that fit the human environment, instead of forcing humans to enter theirs, will make using a computer as refreshing as taking a walk in the woods, right? Well, I don't know about you, but I really don't think we're anywhere near that, right? Um, other, other, other uh, projects, sentient computing project at AT&T, Cambridge University. Now here, kind of the classic model. You've got uh, on the um, on the left side your sensors putting input input into the system. 
internally there's a deliberative process which takes the kind of sensory capture there's a kind of context representation in other words what's the what, what is the specific context that these <coughs> uh, sensors are responding to and then an inference engine which begins to try to deliberate about that context in relationship to the data that's coming in and then output actuating right all then going back into the external environment and feeding back into this kind of loop well, projects like this, and this is you know, characteristic of these AI projects, right? <clears throat> and, you know, it seems all fine and well and clear in this diagram, but in the center here, you see this little box that says context representation, right? <clears throat> um, by that, they mean not just what time of day it is, <clears throat> or where in the building is this person located, or what profile does this person, is this person associated with, right? Uh, <clears throat> but ultimately, they're you know, the, the, the need here is to create world models, right? right? So domain representation. How do you, you know, you know, in a sense, use networks of censure to capture and maintain an internal representation of an indoor environment in this case, <clears throat> which allows the applications then to have greater awareness of users and their requirements. So this, this idea of representing worlds and cosmologies is something which <clears throat> actually turns out in terms of the AI to be a very hard problem and insurmountable. Uh, <clears throat> this project currently is sort of reduced its aspirations, um, and it's actually looking at, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, sentient uh, vehicles and sentient sporting applications. So, mm, you know, your you know, systems which will know um, how far off base uh, this person is is leading. Right? I, don't, I mean, I don't know. Anyway. <clears throat> Sentient city is operative reality. Okay, so if, 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 if we looked at, you know, just a kind of cross-section of what are the sort of technological fantasies, right, science fiction, what are some of the kind of hard research challenges in terms of the technology side, uh, what do we see every day now? Uh, in 2005, uh, Genevieve Bell and Paul Dorish published this essay, Yesterday's Tomorrow's Notes on Ubiquitous Computing's Dominant Vision. Um, Genevieve Bell is a cultural anthropologist who works for Intel, and Paul Dorish is an, a professor of informatics and computer science at UC Irvine. And what they do is they say, well, you know, Mark, it's all fine and well. We have this vision of, um, of ubiquitous computing, right, the computer for the 21st century. Um, and we've had that for 20 years, right? It was in the, uh, 1991 when that article was published, so you know, just about now 15, almost 20 years now. That future that Visor foresaw is here today. We're, we're in that, you know, it is the 21st century. And mm, ubiquitous computing is here, but it's just, it arrived in ways that weren't, didn't really map well to the model that Visor had for it. Um, in this, in this article, they talk about three things, which I just want to quickly sort of identify. One is that <clears throat> the centrality of the, the field of ubiquitous computing's proximate future, um, and the centrality of this idea of the, in the sort of near future, approximate future, continually places its achievements um, out of reach, where, while at the same time binding us to current practice. So effectively, what happens is by focusing on the future that's just around the corner, uh, ubiquitous computing renders contemporary practice, in other words, um, outside of research sites and living labs, by def definition irrelevant, or at least very outmoded, okay? Second, the framing of UbiComp as something yet to be achieved allows researchers and technologists to absolve themselves from responsibilities for the present, which is to say that the kind of hard technical problems, right? You know, the challenges of how do you get all of these systems talking to each other at the most basic level, right? Um, these are issues which are considered not part of, not part or not, not relevant to the current problem, right? Um, and then finally, you know, is this idea that this, this kind of seamlessly interconnected world of future scenarios uh, is at best, they say, a misleading vision, and at worst, a downright dangerous one, right? Homogeneity and an erasure of differentiation is a common feature of future envi in envisionments, and the practice, the day-to-day -day practice, the way we encounter technology is inevitably more messy, it's more complicated, and it's more wrought with frustrations and complications. It's, n it's not a walk in the woods, and it probably never will be a walk in the woods, and in fact, it probably should never become a walk in the woods, right? This is the, the, the point that they're making. Uh, 
things like RFID tags in automobiles enable us to more uh, quickly move through tolls and make our commute that much more uh, efficient. Yet at the same time, this type of information when stored in a database has also been used by law enforcement agencies to track people and bust people for things they've done or haven't done, uh, but at least the data suggests that they might have. Uh, at the same time, you know, we're starting to develop certain types of behaviors and interactions with these systems which aren't part of the kind of initial design agenda, right? So this is somebody using an Oyster card in London and realizing that the range that the RFID card uh, had, the reader has is one which enables her to keep it in her wallet, in her, uh, in, in her purse, and able to just quickly slide it over as she's entering the subway, right? So as important as the, as the way things are initially designed for, Right? the criteria which go into the sort of initial design iteration of an object or a system or a service are <clears throat> the myriad ways that people will use and misuse the systems and find creative new uses for these systems which uh, we as designers haven't normally thought about. Now, <clears throat> then there's the hardcore security stuff. Um, <clears throat> the Lower Manhattan Security Initiative was, um, is actually a project which went live last November. Uh, the design is for 30,000, sorry, 3,000 network surveillance cameras um, uh, enabled with computer vision software. Uh, it went live last, last November with 156 cameras and 30 mobile license plate readers. Um, based more or less on um, London's Ring of Steel, which um, British, British officials have said uh, the image captured by those cameras helped track suspects after the subway bombings in 2005. Uh, in New York, they've installed pivoting uh, road blocks in the streets, literally parts of the streets, which are able to pivot up and prevent traffic from moving. Um, they're still considering whether to use face, face recognition technology, in other words, uh, the ability is everybody familiar with computer vision and how face detection works? Yeah, more or less? I see a couple of heads. Generally speaking, what it's doing is that they're analyzing a video frame, right, frame by frame, and interpreting the sort of <clears throat> visual field of that frame in relationship to a series of models, right, uh, images of people's faces, right. And to a certain extent, they found that by understanding the distance between eyes, and mouth and those geometric proportions, they can with some, well, whether it's reasonable or not, some level of accuracy uh, determine, you know, recognize you, right? Um, right, so software tracking the camera's images would be designed to pick up suspicious behavior. <clears throat> if, for example, a bag, bag is left unattended for a certain length of time or a suspicious car is de detected repeatedly circulating the same block, the system will send out an alert. Now, uh, Mike Crane and Krang and Stephen Graham have been doing some really interesting work. Uh, they come from the world of uh, human geography, more or less. Um, and this, this is literally a slide which comes from uh, the U.S. Defense Science Board's call for what there's a new Manhattan project based on ambient intelligence for tracking, targeting, and locating, right? So what they want to do, they want to be able to locate, identify, and track people, things, and activities in an environment of one in a million to give the United States the same advantage in asymmetric warfare it has today in conventional warfare. Okay, I don't know about you, but that doesn't strike me as a walk in the woods, right? We're talking about a different vision here, and we're talking about a very different model for thinking about ubiquitous computing in urban environments, and we're thinking about sentient cities, which maybe are not necessarily the most benign cities even, right? Um, series of problems, enemy leaders look like everyone else, enemy combatants look like everyone else, enemy vehicles look like civilian vehicles, and so on, and so on, and so on. Two years ago, there was the NYPD in their ever um, uh, helpful suggestions released a profile of what to look out for uh, for terrorists riding the subway. And the profile consisted of, uh, while well, they're wearing a kind of thick, you know, kind of um, bulky jacket, uh, they're wearing cheap cologne or cheap perfume, and they're sweating profusely. 
right? This was the profile. Uh, you know, you see somebody like this, you, know, you see something, say something is their sort of tagline, right? Well, they've basically described about half New Yorkers, right? You know, riding the subway, right? So the defense, the defense science board recognizes this, right? You know, we've got a problem. And of course, what's the answer? Well, technology, right? And so we've got biometrics. Um, and you know, you have the whole range, right? So things as low tech as fingerprints or palm, uh, palm prints, iris scans, all the way up down to smart dust, spy dust. They even use the term spy dust, right? Now this, again, I, I just want to remind you, this is not science fiction anymore. Right? This is not something that we're seeing right, produced by Steven Soderbergh starring George Clooney. Right? This is something that's being rolled out in lower Manhattan today. Right? So what role do we have as what role do we have as designers, as artists, as architects, to begin to participate in the way that these near future urban spaces are shaped, right? What roles can we play in the way that we think about uh, our role as designers in shaping this near future world? This is a video by Chris Oakley. Um, he's a video artist based in the UK. It's a simulation, right? You know, it's, um, this is not real. There's not a shopping mall like this right now. Um, but there could be. There's nothing preventing the, the technological systems here are in place, right? Mm. There's 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 nothing keeping us from um, mapping mm, uh, the sort of RFID tags attached to these articles, with the credit card purchase that this person makes, right? Mm, correlating this data, storing it in a database, being able to call it up at will. What's missing are the policies. Right? And what prevents this from happening now are the way that, for instance, <clears throat> the policies by which uh, who has access to this data? Who can share this data? Right? Uh, one person is collecting the, the credit card transactions. Another person is um, tagging these person or organization is tagging these articles. Another person is, say, <clears throat> take in this case, as we're you're looking at the um, uh, compatible items, so it's being matched here to not just um, what they've bought, but um, you know what they have in their wardrobe that this shirt will go with, right? Now, who manages these relationships? Um, let's see if we can as this moves on. So. The point is, the technology's here, the systems are more or less in place, right? Can be uh, sort of uh, placed more or less in place. But what we don't really have a good handle on is how they should be implemented. We don't have a very good handle on the design criteria for things like, excuse me, access privileges, uh, things like ownership, right? You know, uh, how can you change? Uh, how can you, you know, it's one thing to say, well, okay, you know, What's 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 so harmful about an entrance log uh, to to a shopping mall, right? Who cares, right? Do you care? Do you care if somebody knows you went to a shopping mall? Do you care? Well, yeah, you do. <laughs> There's some people who think they do. Well, but would you care if you went to a shopping mall on a day that you told your partner or your friends that you were doing something else, right? Who has access to this data? Who can see it? Who can begin to match things together? Right? Now, um, you know, here one's looking at, well, it's in one second we'll get to, I think, which for me is my, my favorite sequence. And you know, in the US, we're currently uh, trying to um, get up to speed with the rest of the world with um, doing things like uh, making medical records electronic. Right? Good idea, should happen should have happened many years ago. Uh, the US is still very slow about certain things. Um, <laughs> but for example, what happens when you're at, in this case, a conveyor sushi bar, and you're purchasing food, it's being compared to your daily nutrient uh, levels requirements, and it looks like this person's eating a little too much potassium, they're over on their cholesterol, the gen type prognosis means, whoop, there's probably a cardiac arrest right down the road. Well, your medical insurer is alerted to this, right, matched with your profile, and next thing you know, you've got this incredible bill, right? Your insurance pre premium has tripled. Right? These scenarios are not that 
um, far-fetched. You know? Again, what prevents them from happening is the lack of a policy, right? It's patchwork, right? So questions of trust, questions of privacy, questions of autonomy, and questions of serendipity are ones which we need to have a public discussion about, a public debate about. And I think that's where, that's where designers can begin to play a role. One of the things that's hard in public discussions is when you have, uh, when, when the issues are relatively abstract, right? We don't have concrete uh, points of reference around which we can specifically play out some of the scenarios. So the project that I'm doing, the Sentient City Survival Kit, really I, I see it as a kind of archaeology of the near future. And in doing so, I'm looking to produce physical evidence of a culture and society which doesn't yet exist, right? Traces of this near future sentient city through artifacts, spaces, and media, which would enable one to survive it. Um, now, archaeology is a discipline, is a practice which involves the reconstruction of a world through fragments of artifacts where past cultures are reconstituted in the present through specific socializing and spatializing practices, right? So, you know, archaeologists map things, they classify things, they collect things, and they curate things. This is the way archaeology works, right? You know, you know, trying to understand a culture, a civilization through the artifacts that is left behind and uh, certain processes by which they process them. Um, mm, um, Greg Stevenson wrote this interesting article where he talks about, refers to an archaeology of the contemporary past as the design history of the everyday, right? And I think this is a really, really, for me, a very useful way to think about uh, the everyday vis-a-vis -vis design. Um, where common objects get drawn from daily life, not simply to passively reflect cultural forces, like trends in taste or fashion, right? Uh, but also to actively participate in shaping the evolving social and spatial relations between people and their environment, which is to say that, you know, artifacts, spaces, media, mediate our relationships, right? They tell us not just something about what they are. We like um, smooth things. We like rectilinear things. No, right? They talk about as well, and perhaps more importantly, the way we begin to relate to each other. Uh, we like asynchronic communication. We like right, you know, synchronic communication. We like face-to-face -face communication, we, you know, and so on, and so on, and so on. So this process, and to a certain extent, you know, you know, I'm sort of influenced by people like, you know, Anthony Dunn, Fiona Raby, their work in critical design, where, you know, it's not so much about sort of forecasting uh, sort of future trends, right? It's not about, you know, becoming a technology consultant, right? And sort of forecasting future trends, writing white, white papers and research for large technology players. But it's about working with the raw material that's coming out of the sort of computer science and engineering labs and beginning to tease out some of the more absurd assumptions, the hidden biases and agendas, right? Um, in some cases, the ludicrous um, uh, oversights that, that exist within things like computer science and engineering labs um, or law enforcement um, um, PowerPoint presentations and try to kind of play out um, these assumptions through designing for absurdities, for these absurdities. So the idea is not so much to predict a future, right, but is to begin to provoke a public discussion about just what kind of future we might want, right, and to do that through design. So mm, I'm going to close by just quickly presenting, the, currently there are four items in the kit. Um, these are uh, very much in development. Um, so in the near future world where finding our way from point A to point B is not going to be the problem, um, uh, but um, somehow f finding ways to find something else, right? To, to get lost, right? To lose sight of what happens, to not lose sight of what happens along the way. Um, an alternative GPS navigation software application for mobile phones that determines a route to a destination that the user has not previously taken. Designed to facilitate something by looking for something else. Um, in a near future world like that shopping mall where we've got item level tagging, 
um, in, and uh, um, remote data sniffing or clandestine data sniffing uh, are both common corporate practice as well as popular criminal pastimes. Uh, his and hers undergarments designed to sense hidden radio frequency identification tag readers and alert the wearer to their presence by activating small vibrators sewn into bras and boxer shorts. Ad hoc dark, no dark roast travel mug. Well, in an age where all communications are potentially monitored, but also where access and bandwidth are allocated in part in relationship to your market capitalization and your credit history, um, ad hoc mesh network radios in the form of travel mugs. Right, commuter travel mugs, where uh, communication can be uh, developed along one's morning commute. Here's the mug in process. On the right side, you'll see this little dot. You know, the, the idea here is, you know, I mean, it's one thing to have a display device in a mug. That's a very simple problem. But how do you get an input device? Well, you know, the idea here is to capitalize on uh, this sort of caffeine-fueled tapping of fingers on the side of a mug. So we've got a capacitance sensor which enables people to tap out Morse code. So the mug works, but I'm not very good at Morse code yet. So that's a little bit of a bug. Uh, finally, the uh, CCD not umbrella. Uh, this is an umbrella studded with infrared LEDs visible only to CCD surveillance cameras designed to frustrate object detection algorithms used in computer vision surveillance uh, systems. So there's the umbrella. These are uh, 950 nanometer LEDs, not visible uh, to the human eye, but very much visible to uh, surveillance cameras equipped with night vision uh, capabilities. And computer vision algorithms tracking, say, in this case, umbrellas, right? This with the umbrellas turned on. Um, here, just a preliminary study where uh, the umbrella is really just in the lower right hand uh, frame is really, I think, what, what's, what's important here. Um, <clears throat> Typically, these computer vision algorithms um, take several steps to process an image. Uh, the first thing that happens is the noise is reduced, and so uh, the image is reduced to a kind of grayscale. Uh, the second thing that happens is what's called the background subtraction, where you see it's just kind of black and white, <clears throat> um, or in a sense, binarization of what's happening here. And then following this initial simplification, the software, software counts, measures, and identifies objects, dimensions, and defects, or other features in the image. And that's what you're seeing in the lower right. And all that's happening here at this point is blob, uh, sorry, uh, blob detection and edge tracking, right? So it's just tracking the edge and the blob, and showing just very simply how something not visible to the human eye right, um, can look very different to, right, to the surveillance camera. Mm. Okay, so mm, what are the questions at, well, you know, what's, what's at stake here? Um, I mean, collectively, I'm interested in how these artifacts, spaces, and media might ask, you know, in what kind of city would I be viable, right? In what kind of city would I be useful, right? In what kind of city would I be necessary or even popular for that matter, right, for each of these objects? Who made me and, and for what purpose, right? How do you begin to instill some of the kind of lines of questioning that are traditional to fields such as archaeology in terms of trying to imagine what this city is through, through its darker sides, right? You know, what relations between people and their, their environment do I suggest as an object? In what places, circumstances, and situations would I be found? What, in what places, circumstances, and situations would I be banned? Right? And what ones would I be right? um, confiscated? Who? Who would ban me? Right? Toward what ends? So again, you know, ultimately the project here, in, you know, in conclusion, is, is, is it's less invested in forecasting future trends in technology. Right? Um, 
but it's more about trying to provoke a public discussion around just what kind of future we want. And this design process is involved look, looking just what's happening upstream in computer science and engineering R&D labs and teasing out some of the more absurd assumptions, latent biases, and hidden agendas that play there. And ultimately, the production of the physical working prototypes then becomes a chance to play out the design implications of these assumptions and you know, to begin to develop a series of questions. It's not so much about providing answers to these you know, issues of trust, serendipity, autonomy, privacy, but to, beginning to, to, be able to, be ask, to, to be able to ask more specific questions about them, to get our questions um, more clear. OK. That's it. Um, sorry if that went a little long. <laughs> I'd, I'd be happy to take any questions if you have any, any questions. Sure. Um, you, with your survival kit, you're talking about the darker side of the near future, but and they all you um, mentioned they are recognized, they all rely on this playful or ironic commentary. And do you think we need that as to be able to digest those? That's a good question. Yeah, I, you know, when I started the project, I, you know, first responses were, you know, I, I was scaring people, right? And, you know, one of the things that you don't want to do in this kind of work is just scare people, because then they don't start thinking very clearly about things. Um, in fact, it's a tactic which has been used by uh, some previous administrations, you know, for very particular ends. Right? So I didn't want to get involved in, in that type of debate, right? Which ultimately is not a debate. So the playfulness, where does that come into play? I mean, on the one hand, it enables, I think, it to, to, to engage a more general audience. And I think that's the one thing that's um, important to recognize here is that, uh, you know, this, these, these, are, these artifacts aren't intended to speak to, uh, you know, specifically a kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, technologist's audience or a designer's audience, but a more general audience. And it's the first time I've, I've in, in my work I've tried to do that. And so I've found that playfulness in some levels makes it more accessible to broader people. You know, but the flip side of that is to what degree does it become dismissed, right? You know, do the issues become you know, consumable, laughed, thrown away, right? That's the counter side, right? So you have to be able to try to you know, walk the fine line. And you know, again, as a work in progress, I wouldn't necessarily claim that I'm able to find exactly what that line yet, right? Um, what do you think? I think you're doing it. No, 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 not in terms of what I'm doing, in terms of playfulness. I mean, oh, I and the role of playfulness in, in designed objects. You think it's important? You know? Well, when, when you're opening up a critical discussion, I think it helps as a tool. Mm -hmm. and, but it is about making sure it's not on the ridiculous or hysterical side. Right. Which en enables it to be dismissed pretty easily. Right. Yeah. Good. Yes, up in the back. Right. <clears throat> How do you see, see your work uh, in that Yeah, well, first, I think it's a, it's a kind of funny term, critical design. Uh, you know, I don't think it's well formed. Um, uh, it's uh, one which I think uh, Anthony Dunn popularized in his book, Hertzian Tales. And it was in like 1998, 1999. Um, I think, you know, other people such as like Natalie Jeremichenko, uh, Christoph Wojcicko, um, also practice critical design, but they probably wouldn't self-identify as doing so. Um, interestingly, when Dunn, you know, in, in the passage where he, do, you know, where he coins the term, basically, uh, you know, he looks to architecture and he says, well, architecture has this long tradition, tradition of the ideas competition. And it's, in, you know, are, are people familiar with what an architectural ideas competition is? Some okay. Well, just for those of you who aren't, it's 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 a long-standing practice, hundreds of years, where rather than having a design competition for a building which gets built right and serves a purpose, you develop an ideas competition around an issue, right, which 
is, and the entries are solicited for cultivating and provoking public discussion around, you know, what should we do in the center of this city, right? Not, you know, get a solution, but let's collect a series of ideas which expand the way we're thinking about what's possible. Um, and so when Dunn defines critical design, he does it by looking to architecture and says, well, you know, within architecture they have this tradition, why can't we do that for product design, right? So I'm not a product designer, right? You know, I'm not grappling with any of the very sort of real issues and real concerns that go along with imagining products for mass markets, right? Or even, you know, not mass markets, niche markets, right? Um, so I come at it from the point of view of, as an artist, right, uh, who has a background in design uh, coming from architecture. And so in this way, I mean, you know, also Anthony Dunn, you know, they, his, and again, you know, if we're going to speak to his, you know, the way they frame critical design, which I think is, you know, very valuable, uh, and I'm a huge fan of their work, I should say, um, that, uh, you know, one of the things he'll say is that, you know, well, critical design is not art, right? You know, he'll say, that, you know, art is much more, how does he say, you know, extreme or wild or wacky or, um, you know, which I would disagree with. Right? I would say, you know, it actually is. There, there, there are aesthetic techniques at play, both in terms of its production and its reception, right? So it's, I guess to answer your question, uh, I have a very complicated relationship to this, this term, critical design, but I think it's one which um, benefits from not being too tightly controlled, one might say, right? Um, does that answer your question? Do you think? Uh, anyone? Oh, I saw you raise your hand. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you want to go to the pub, we can go to the pub, too. <laughs> um, seems like, uh, according to Mark Beiser, he mentioned that the most profound technologies are those that disappeared. And uh, it seems like we are going toward this ubiquitous technology at this moment. Um, but what if we go further and become more environmental, like you don't have to depend on this physical, tangible object, rather, um, and again, Mark Beiser said, like, it blends into right. the society. And how do we stand as a product designer um, in this evolution of technology? Like, how do we stand as yeah. a designer? Good question. Um, you know, this, this whole idea about the disappearing computer is fraught with problems, right? Um, you know, one has to ask, you know, is it, do we really want them to disappear, right? Uh, you know, when we're not aware of certain things, like take contactless payment systems, for example. Yeah. Um, you know, at what point does the barrier between you making a purchase, you know, diminish to the point where you're no longer even thinking about what you're purchasing on a daily basis, right? Um, so what I'm trying to get at is there is this sort of counter idea that instead of a sort of seamless interconnected world of computation which is environmental and we inhale it, right? Uh, you know, there is, there is a kind of counter notion that as designers we actually need to design beautiful seams, right? You know, it becomes important to know, say, when we're entering into an area which, um, you know, I'm, and you know, you see this in terms of surveillance cameras, right, being distributed, they generally speaking, excuse me, now, <clears throat> you know, they're having these um, blue, at least in, in New York, uh, you know, they have these blue LED lights blinking on top of them. So, you, you know, they're not seamless, they're very obvious, right? So how do you make people aware, you know, when, you know, you're collecting data from them, right? How do you make them aware of when they've uh, moved from a more private zone to a more public zone? How do you make them aware that, for instance, you know, your phones, how, ma how many of you have a phone which has, is Bluetooth capable? Yeah, so pretty many. And do, do you have it set to discoverable? No. Yeah. And what, when did you learn about that option? And what made you make that decision? Anyone, just, did you see something? Receiving or? stuff in bars. What's that? Receiving kind of sent information in bars from anonymous okay. people. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right. So you know, it's at this level where the negotiation starts to happen. I think it's at this level where design operates, right? And you know, whether you're designing services, for instance, like mobile services, that becomes you know some. You know, it's, that's a good question. Are there service designers in the room? Come on, fess up. No. One. No. Okay. It's product designers. One. There's one hand, right? Do people develop software applications for mobile phones here? No. Ah, okay, some people. All right. You know, so you know, these are kinds, you know, certain kinds of questions. But you could also, you know, ask the same question about the, the you know, the, the, the physical design, or the, you know, the industrial design of the artifact itself. Now, if you think about the first Sony Walkman, right? You know, one of the things that was amazing about that is that it had this little orange. First, it had two headphone jacks, right? And it had a little orange button. Actually, let's just see if I can find this image. Now it's going to take me too long to find it. It's easier to describe it. Um, two headphone jacks, a big orange button. What was the button for? What was it labeled? Sharing. Huh? Sharing. Sharing? Oh, kind of. Not really. <laughs> what was the word? Play. It's what it affected. It enabled what? Play? play. No, not play. <laughs> it was the yeah the orange one. It was the talk button. Right? What it did, it, they didn't label it mute, they labeled it talk. And this device was originally designed for two people to be listening together. Right? And that there was the understanding that, right, the designers were understanding that in designing this object, you needed to you know, kind of engage the sort of social interactions that it afforded or it hindered. Right? So. I mean, you know, today we have this practice of playlist sharing or um, you know, sharing earbuds. One, I get the left, you get the right kind of thing. Right. Any other questions? I have one. Another one. Sure. Um, just, I've been thinking about this, um, just personal question. Would you uh, rather live in an uh, autonomous society with sensing technology or flipped? Uh, sensing society with autonomous technology. Oh. Mm. I like that. I like that line of thinking. And where do you think it's going? Oh. Well, again, I'm not in the business of forecasting future trends. That, that's <laughs> other people's job who are much better at it than I am. Um, but what would I want uh, is a different question. Um, Autonomous technologies with sensing societies versus sensing technologies versus autonomous society. Well, I mean, definitely. I mean, for me, the, the, my first reaction is, of course, I want an autonomous society, right? You know, I, I, I really value, part of the reason I live in big cities is the degree of autonomy you can have in them. And it's one thing I very much appreciate about urban life. And, and, and the problem with when you think about autonomous technologies is that they're never actually ever truly autonomous, right? You know, I mean, we think of that, you know, as it's of things automatically appearing or disappearing, right? Um, but there's actually, you know, tr the, 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 there's, there's actually a tremendous amount of kind of human tethering that happens pretty much each step along the way. So the system in New York, for instance, Lower Manhattan Security I Initiative, it doesn't autonomously, you know, move this roadblock up and down, right? You know, there's never, somebody at some point, even you know, at the level of code, somebody had to write those ifs and those conditional statements, right? They had to set the criteria about which this thing was looking for, or at least train a neural network to begin to learn what to look for, right? So, you know, there's never anything as sort of purely autonomous, much in the same way that you never have a purely autonomous society, right? Uh, but you never have a purely autonomous technology either. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Great questions.